All right, I'm Pastor Doug. Well, you, you can either like me or dislike me after this, but I get to preach today. And, uh, you know, God is an amazing God, right? God never fails to uh, work on me all the time. I'm always a work in progress. But the weeks that I am preaching, God seems to be able to take the text and my life and go, let's see what we, let's see what we can do with this. Um, this has been kind of a cruddy week for me. I'll just be real honest with you. Early, about midway through the week, uh, our beloved Carlene, who you all know, her husband John passed away. And if Carlene's heart breaks, our heart breaks because she's just the bedrock of the office. And um, so we love her deeply and our pain is deep with hers and we rejoice that John is not struggling anymore. Two days after that, uh, a very good friend of mine who had had a, lo- a double lung transplant passed away. And he was best man at my wedding and just a beloved. And, you know, when your friends start dying, ugh, right? I know all, many of you have experienced deep loss as well. And it makes me mad. I don't like it. And I want to talk to who's in charge. And so that leads me up to uh, my sermon for today about who's in charge this chaos that sometimes seems to hover around. You know what I'm talking about? Where there just seems to be this dump truck of stuff that comes in your front yard and just goes, you know what, I think we'll leave this right here. Or at least that's how it kind of feels. I know many of you all have gone through times of chaos. And um, sometimes chaos can be constructive, but sometimes at the very, very beginning, you want to put on waders and just say, Enough of this, let's, let's be done with this. My way of dealing with this is kind of going back and trying to find, A, who's in charge, and is anybody in charge, and putting things in order and trying to find purpose and meaning. Because if I find purpose and meaning, then I will go through the door that, oh, now I get it. We all know that that door doesn't necessarily exist. And that some things, horrible, no good, very bad things, just happen. They just happen. Uh, And then it's left to us and our faithfulness to put the pieces back together. Well, when I was a young man, going to church in Sunday school, I was a good little, you know, every Sunday morning, Dougie Meyer would put on his clip-on tie and my great big reader's Bible and go to Sunday school. But I was kind of the antagonist. Can you all imagine that? I did look very sharp, though. I had a blue sport coat, and I would wear khakis and a white shirt and a clip-on tie. I was very impressed with myself. And my dad would put uh, that greasy stuff. I had a flat top. That was before my hair all fell out, John. And I had a flat top. And butch wax. Remember that stuff? It came in a little tin. You know you're getting old when you say, remember that? (laughs) Because young people don't say that. They don't have anything to remember. They... uh, Remember before the internet? They don't remember that. Life was better. Um, Where was I going with all that? So I was the antagonist in Sunday school. I got kicked out of eighth grade Sunday school class because I kept asking why. Who said? How come? Dr. Smith was our Sunday school teacher, and he was really should have been an orator. Because he would stand there, and he'd like to hear himself talk. And he would talk and talk and talk and talk. And then he would say, does anybody have any questions? But he really didn't mean, he just had that in the script. And he didn't really want you to ask a question. But I'd be like, why? Who made God? Who? And one Sunday morning, he just said, Mr. Meyer, would you please leave the class? On one hand, I was kind of glad. And then I, because I saw it kind of as a badge of honor. How cool it I don't know that that really means you're cool if you get kicked out of Sunday school. But when I was in eighth grade, I thought, man, I was super cool. Um, So I still try to, I look at things, big things, hard, hurtful things, and I try to figure out why. Why did that happen? What's going on here? And um, as a person of faith, I try to find the answers in my faith. And sometimes I do, and other times I just go to bed mad. But part of my doing that is also trying to just figure out kind of that uh, that sense of who am I and where did I come from? Because I think if I can figure that out, well, then I'll figure the next thing out. How many of you all have tried to figure out where you came from? Like, who are your people? You know what I'm talking about? 
genealogy. How many of you all have, uh, are part of the 15 million people that pay to join Ancestry.com? Raise your hand. All right, y'all, a lot of people are not raising your hands because 15 million people did it, and they're going to the bank with that. You know, they have 20 billion pieces of stuff that link us and all of our people together. I also did the little thing where you spit in a, in a little test tube. You have to really work up a bunch of spit, and you send that away. I, mine went to China. Did y'all go to China? I don't... Then I saw a weather balloon over my house. I got, it was, it was just very, it was very unsettling. But um, they came back and they said, you are 92% Scandinavian. Go figure. And my people are all from Denmark and Sweden. And then there's like the crumbs. You know how they kind of say, we don't know, it's mutt. There's just, it's little pieces. Pastor Doug, what's this have to do with anything? It has to do with, we struggle so hard to find purpose and meaning and where we came from. And there's another story about where we all came from. It's in the Bible. And it's interesting in that there's a lot of stuff to be said about Genesis. Matter of fact, frequently in seminaries, it takes an entire semester, and I have 15 minutes. <laughs> As a preacher, that just, that's like, what, really? Come on. Um, there are Tidbits that I think you might find interesting. Uh, there are records that show that this is the oldest of the oldest of the oldest of stories dating back, they think, to 6 B.C. Now, that's a, that's a long time ago. They also have found evidence that this is um, a story to counter another story, that back in that day, every different tribe, every different group of people had... Um, of creation, had a, a where we came from story. And that uh, the Mesopotamians had a story in which they uh, wiped out the Israelites. Well, the Israelites said, no, 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 our creation story beats your creation story. And our creation story is in the book of Genesis. One last little tidbit, not to rock your boat too much, but um, there is a Genesis chapter 1 creation story, then there's a Genesis chapter 2 creation story. They're two different, they're not competing, some say they're complementary, but they are different. So this morning we're going to experience those just a little bit to see if maybe we can figure out who and why and what's up and who's in charge. Chapter 1, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete chaos. Go figure. And darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let us, us, make humans in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Did you notice that right off the bat? The earth was complete what? Chaos. Hmm. I also am intrigued with in verse 26 when God said, let us, us. As a little kid, I always just thought God was like solo. Who's, who else is helping God in our image? Intriguing questions. Chapter 2 starts this way. Mine has a little caption. Another account of the creation. I don't know if yours has that or not. But it says, In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no vegetation of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. Really important little bracket. Put that in the back of your head. Till the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden over on the east side, in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
Let me just stop there for a little minute, a little tidbit to show off you know stuff to your friends. The knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Um, Many believe that what that is is actually a, a way to say everything. If good is on this side and evil is on this side, the writer was trying to communicate to us that everything from good to evil, all knowledge was contained in that tree. Not just good stuff and evil stuff, but what? All stuff. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, you may eat freely of every tree of the garden, but for the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you you shall not eat that. For in that day you eat it, you shall die. Man, are any of you all like this? Or you have a kid like this? What, What would be the tree that your kid would want to go eat from? That tree. I was that kid. I was like, what tree don't you want me to eat from? Oh, that's one we're going to right now, God. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought to them, to the man, to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. Wouldn't you like to have been there for that? What do you think? Here come the elephants. What happened to come up? Elephant, giraffe. Hippopotamus. I heard a story once, and I'm going to get it wrong, but because it was man naming the animals, that's why, like, cat and dog just have three letters. They're just, we are simpletons, we men. Like, we couldn't, I don't think a man could come up with, like, alligator. There's too many syllables. We would have come up with a much shorter word. Anyway, I thought that was funny. The man gave names to all the cattle. Names to the cattle? Or did he call them cow? Dog, cat, cow, or did he name them? Like, is that where Elsie got her name? I don't know. I'm not trying to be sacrilegious, but I kind of sound that way. And to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field, but for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. Okay. So these texts have been abused and used throughout time as trying to define the role of man and woman and Uh, like helper and partner and well a man's in charge and I know Paul said all this other stuff but for me and my household my wife is my equal partner it's not a me in charge her in charge I married a partner to be a co-director of our lives so I'm not just saying that because her lovely self is right here (laughs) she wrote it down for me to say it just like that So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, wow. No, I just added that little part. (laughs) Don't you know if I could rewrite the Bible? It would be. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Wow, go figure. Both were naked and were not ashamed. Just imagine if it all ended right there. And that's how we would come to church today. Look at your neighbor and look around. All you naked people. I think we would sit a little further apart. I think there might even be individual chairs. I don't know. But I think if we were naked, we wouldn't know we were naked. Naked would just be an okay thing, right? I don't know why I'm not in church. We did solve earlier at the 930 service the whole naked or naked thing. It's naked. I don't know where you're from, but it's naked. All right, so why am I going on and on about this? Because it helps me to figure out that God is in charge and I'm not. Thanks be to God. I do wonder what God was doing the day before God started creating. 
Did God look out and see all of that chaos and said, you know, I need to make some sense of all of this? I think maybe that was part of it. I don't know about you, but I, I appreciate that because when I look out at the chaos, I need to see God. I need God to show up and help me make sense of the stuff that seems senseless, that I don't have the tools to figure out why those normal, whole good, very bad things happened or why the people I love die or what. I know death will come to all of us, but it comes sometimes when we don't want it to come. One of the things I appreciate that I have learned this week is that God is not done with creation. That he didn't fit, write chapters one and two and go, well there, isn't that nice? But that God is still in the business of creating out of chaos. And I think the product is hope. I think that which God is about gives me hope. I hope it gives you hope. For me, I see an amazing picture of hope and it looks a lot like um, a mosaic. Do you have a friend or maybe you do this where you, you take bits and pieces of glass and pottery and old china and this and that and it looks, looks like a if somebody dumped a bucket up that they had dropped their china off the moving truck. And they pick it up and they begin to form new and different and beautiful pictures that are a reflection of what was before, but they are now anew. They have a link to the old, but they have formed a new and amazing picture. From the brokenness comes a new picture. I feel some days like I was in that box that got dropped and I'm still in the pieces of the broken being ready to be placed in the new picture. Do you ever have days when you feel like that? You're just looking forward to the hot glue, so to speak. And so I look, I look out in this chaos and this hurt that I know many of you all have experienced and I need to find that God is still at work. And I see it, I come upon it at times. Many of y'all know that I, 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 I like to play with cameras and I sometimes will take a picture here or there. And one of the things that gives me hope is when I go out and I take a photograph and I use this little lens on my camera that's a macro. That means you can kind of get the picture right at the end of your nose. And when you do that, you get to see almost the very inner workings of a plant or, or whatever you're taking a picture of. And I love flowers and I love... In them, I see God at work in the detail, in the color, in the fragrance, and in the design. And what I'm reminded of is when a flower blooms, it is beautiful and fragrant, but it won't last forever, will it? And in God's timing, it will drop off and it will die. And what it will leave, though, is a seed, which is the piece of the future that God has also ordered, that it will continue this amazing cycle of God's creation. I also see it in, in nature when the, the seasons change. Aren't we glad that when God created, God didn't just say, and I think there will be July, and he stopped. Aren't you glad? I am very glad that God did not stop creation with July. I am glad there is October ish when it begins to get fall ish around here and leaves change their color and i am glad that there are places that get snow i would rather it just not be us and i am amused at times by a nice gentle afternoon rain i think i see god in all of that i see god in relationships where god is helping you and me do life together Sometimes that's chaotic and messy, isn't it? If that has not visited your house yet, it will. Being in relationship and in partnership and doing life with other people is just by its very nature messy because, well, we're messy. But one of the things that I find great hope in is when we kind of combine our messiness, we seem to be able to kind of make our way together. When I see you come alongside somebody who is just what we will just call a train wreck <laughs> because their life is just messing us out of control. And you say, you know what, how about if I walk with you for the next while? 
And after a while, you say, you know what? I can, I can carry that bucket. Let me carry your bucket that maybe is full of tears. Or maybe I, let me put that pack on my back for a while. You all do that amazingly well. I see God in all of our efforts to help others find hope. The hope that I think was born in Genesis and continues to Revelation where God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have a little role in that, though, my friends. We have to be willing to release it. Have you ever met somebody that is just um, chaos in capital letters? That their life is just a swirled mess of madness, but they want to hold on to it very tightly? If you come and offer to walk with them, they're like, oh, no, I got this. It's all good. And they take great effort to tell you about how heavy their load is. How about if I carry that for you? No, 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 no. Their identity is defined in their heavy, heavy burden. If that is you, I would encourage you to set that down. It makes walking a whole lot, a whole lot easier. That setting down is going to be life-giving for you. So if you're ready to let go of that and to say, God, make of my chaos what you will, God is more than ready. Matter of fact, God's ready right now. I invite you to think this afternoon long and hard about order and meaning and purpose in God's presence in your life to open your eyes. Maybe after the sun goes down, take a walk. God's ready to take a walk with you. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you that you are ever-present, loving us, enduring our complaining and wondering who's in charge. But you lovingly remind us that you have this. You always have and always will. In your loving name we all pray. Amen.